I'm Rachel Woody. I'm here with Eugenia Keegan at Grand Moraine, and it's July 26, 2016. And our first question for you is why wine? <laughs> why wine? Um, I grew up in a reasonably European style family, although my parents have lived in California for generations. Um, but a real sensibility around food and wine and a lot of agriculture. And uh, I think it was really a trip to Europe uh, for a year that sent me over the edge of, mm -hmm. oh heck, that can be actually a profession. Um, right. and I think that's what, uh, that was when the bug bit me. And did you, do you recall a specific experience or, or what it was about that trip that helped to inspire you? I think it was mostly the European lifestyle. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't, um, I wasn't visiting vineyards. I was still in college at the time. Mm -hmm. So I was just visiting life. Uh, in culture and I just really liked, um, I've always li been drawn to the agricultural way of living and it just emphasized that that was not just about agriculture, that that was a whole lifestyle. Mm -hmm. and that's sort of what I fell in love with. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so how did you go about getting into the wine industry? What did that look like for you? Well, I was pretty fortunate. I was born in Sonoma County and my grandparents uh, had a farm and a vineyard and still do, it's still in the family. Mm -hmm. And so I grew up hanging out with my grandfather. Uh, we did have grapevines then, but it was very traditional um, Sonoma County agriculture, starting with cattle mm -hmm. uh, and going into hops and then beans and prunes and then grapes and so I was exposed to all that and those were always my favorite times was hanging out with my grandfather so I moved back to Sonoma County after some time in Los Angeles um, working in the film industry which I loved but Los Angeles was not quite my style and I got home and you moved to Sonoma County and you look around and it was even then 40 years ago it was an obvious obvious choice right yeah. Did you, I know you had some hands-on application and practice, did you seek some formal education or do some apprenticeships? Um, I did, actually I applied to Davis and I tried to do some of that and then I thought, well why, I already had a degree and I thought, well, <clears throat> excuse me, why do that again mm -hmm. when I can just work inside the cellars? And so I started working in vineyards and cellars, so did a number of apprenticeships or short-term employments uh, in California, they weren't formalized as internships, mm -hmm. and then did formal internships in France for the Wonderful. winemaking part, mostly the winemaking part. Were you pretty um, set on the French style of winemaking? Did you sort of dabble or check into others, or was it predominantly France? No, it was French. It was very much that new world experience and bringing that approach and that philosophy to grape growing in Sonoma County and Napa County. Mm -hmm. So you've had quite an experience thus far in the wine industry, both California and Oregon. Could you sort of highlight for us some of the milestones for you as you moved forward to where you are now? Oof, that's a, a question that takes some reflection, but I suppose um, some of the milestones really had to do less with maybe my personal environment and my personal winery or employment mm -hmm. and more of the community service. Um, in Napa, I was the chairman of the Napa Valley Wine Auction, now called Auction Napa Valley. Mm -hmm. And the idea that all of a sudden I had millions of dollars that I was allowed to participate in giving that away, I will never have $10 million to give away, um, that kind of thing was really rewarding. So in many ways it was my experiences outside of my specific employment and usually community driven. Mm -hmm. um, it's an incredible group of people in the wine industry and working with them um, all, all these years has been fantastic, really. It's the people. Yes, most definitely. Yeah. Um, we know that you've had experience and are involved with Kendall Jackson Winery, mm -hmm. and so we're wondering what the origins of that are. Mm -hmm. So I really work for Jackson Family Wines, which means I, in my case I have no interaction with Kendall Jackson other than mm -hmm. hanging out with the unbelievable winemakers. Um, but Jackson Family has uh, over 40 wineries around the world, and um, in California alone they have 12,000 planted acres, so it's a vast um, family-owned company. Barbara Banky still owns and runs the company, um, so if you want it, you gotta, you gotta get Barbara to want it. Um, and she's very decisive, very thoughtful. Um, so it was really a total serendipity, um, a total moment of kismet. Uh, when Jackson Family invested in Oregon, uh, my partner David Adelsheim and I decided that 
The right community thing to do was to invite them over for lunch and welcome them into the community, make sure they had personal resources. And it was at the lunch at Adelsheim and I was a consultant and I had just bought some vineyards in France and so I was kind of semi-retired. Mm -hmm. And uh, we chatted about what we were doing and of course it happens that my family vineyard is right next door to their La Crema brand. So obviously I know the area. Mm -hmm. And we know all the same people and reference points. And about three days later, I got a call from the COO and said, we need a GM and a winemaker up in Oregon. What are you really doing? <laughs> and uh, that was kind of the beginning of the conversation. And here I am. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, so what had brought you to Oregon? Because I think it was before that you were already in Oregon. Yeah, yeah. I've yeah. been here for over 15 years, and that was David Adelsheim. <laughs> oh, okay. So it was romance. It was total Aww. romance. I was working in California happily, mm -hmm. and uh, it was clear that one of us was going to make the move. And mm -hmm. I had a very small brand in California, Keegan Sellers, mm -hmm. and I was making it in a custom crush environment, so it was much easier for me to physically make the move. And now that I've been up here for 15 years, I am so glad about that. So Good. I love being in Oregon. Good. Yeah, it's very special. So before uh, coming in for Grand Moraine and the Jackson family, and you were in Oregon for 15 years, did you sort of dabble in some different wine ventures, or, or what did that time look like for you? <laughs> yes, I did, and <laughs> one of them was running a distribution company. I founded mm -hmm. that in 2003 and merged that in 2006 with the Henry Wine Group of California mm -hmm. to grow it. Mm -hmm. And it was, uh, and we sold it in 2009. And it was a grueling, grueling business. Mm -hmm. um, everybody is upset with you for something. You raise the price, you ran out of wine, your delivery is two minutes late, I don't know. Right. But I'm used to this um, you know, agricultural environment, very, very passionate people, and it was really a lot of hard work. And mm -hmm. I, have a, I always thought distributors did a, a good job. Now I have undying respect for their work. It's very hard work. So once I sold that, I was very I was uncommitted, mm -hmm. and that's when I spent uh, several months in France. Just I had fallen in love with Grenache, and so mm -hmm. I just drove around and looked at Grenache vineyards in northern Spain and in southern France, and, and did harvest over there in 10, 11, and 12, and bought some vineyards there, and so it was a wonderful interim experience. Wonderful. Yeah. What was it like transitioning uh, into Grand Moraine? And what has that experience been like for you working here? Well, it's been really fun because there was no Grand Moraine before we mm -hmm. got started. So often you're brought into an existing brand and then you have certain requirements and brand style and things that you need to do. But we, had, we were allowed to create an entirely new brand style here and I got to do it. And it was terrifying and incredibly exciting. Mm -hmm. And it started, of course, with the Grand Moraine Vineyard that's outside of Carlton. So, you know, once you have that resource, that determines a lot of what you're going to do. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we're going to make Pinot Noir. We've, we make Chardonnay as well. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the style and being able to, once again, bring my European approach and philosophy back to winemaking uh, was really a, an incredible opportunity. Not just that, but with a world-class vineyard and in a world-class winery. So mm -hmm. it was, you know, kind of a dream come true. They say that winemaker, winery, and vineyard are the three legs of the stool. There they were. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So in this experience and the distributorship, and I'm sure some of your other work experiences, what is it like trying to work with a company that may not be in your state or across the nation? Yeah. What is that like? You know, it's pretty good. Um, obviously, there's a little bit more paperwork and bureaucracy, mm -hmm. uh, but most of it is really of value. We have a robust safety program. Um, I, I, my whole life is different now. I look at safety and hazards completely different mm -hmm. after this training. Right. You know, like getting up on a folding chair, which we would do without thinking twice, and now I'm like, you're not supposed to do that. Um, and, and so there's a lot of program, the wellness program and the benefits. And I mean, there are just a lot of things that a bigger company can bring to the table. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, it can probably slow things down, but this company being family owned, literally there's only a half a dozen people in the big decision room. So it can turn very quickly on a dime. So mm -hmm. um, 
Mostly it's been a positive experience and again we've got 1,700 employees and we just finished our uh, global sales meeting here in Oregon in Portland and wine country and we had 300 people from sales and marketing and they're just these unbelievable people. They're mm -hmm. super passionate, mm -hmm. incredibly wine knowledgeable and they go out and hit those streets every day. So you've worked in a lot of various areas of the wine industries. What are some of the areas that you have felt the most passionate about or have been the most inspired by? Simplest question ever, the vineyard. Mm. The vineyard. I mean, I could spend all my time out there if I were allowed to. So, you know, the beauty is every morning I run off to the vineyard before I come into the winery and very, very often I'll head over there at 5.30, 6, 6.30 and of course, what a beautiful way to end the evening and walking around the vineyard. So mm -hmm. that, that's the place that's most important to me, mm -hmm. the vineyard. Are you able in this current job to get out there and be involved a little bit, or what oh, yes. does your role look like? Yes, absolutely. Okay. So I'm out there from about now through harvest every day. Mm -hmm. So I was out for a couple hours this morning. Uh, we're just starting Verasion, and so it's mm -hmm. like, oh, it's really going to happen. And actually, a month from now, we'll be in harvest. So it's yeah, it's petrifying all of a sudden. Yeah. It's like here it is. Mm -hmm. um, but so my role is evolving, of course, and I'm the Oregon general manager, and mm -hmm. that's become more of a job as we um, have acquired Penner Ash and continue to grow our business up here. Mm -hmm. um, and I have been the winemaker for Graham Rain up until now where we're sort of moving those uh, responsibilities over to uh, my associate Shane Moore. Mm -hmm. But I still am involved with all the tasting and the blending and out in the vineyard doing picks and calling picks and things like that. So, yep, I get plenty of time in the vineyard. Good, And good. if I don't, I just take it. No. Well, yeah, that's yeah. what you have to do. Yeah, exactly. Which is why I go there first thing in the morning. Because mm -hmm. everybody knows once you get into the office, you're caught. Mm -hmm. So you just do that first thing and then it's, it's uh, been done for the day. Good. Yeah. Do you have a grape growing philosophy? Huh. I suppose, interestingly enough, it's the same thing I learned 40 years ago, which was about vine balance. Mm. And in fact, 20 years ago, I was in a lecture series on VIT and I happened to sit down next to a guy that I had gone to VIT school with and the first thing we both did was put our glasses on to see the screen <laughs> so that was kind of a laugh <laughs> and then we realized while well, we've watched all of these changes and there have been lots of changes it's amazing when I talk to young people and I think about what we knew then and what we thought then and what we know now and what we mm -hmm. understand and it's hugely evolving mm -hmm. we, we don't know that much in the end but when you think about it, it's vine balance, whether you're talking about watering the vine or the relationship of the canopy to the fruit, um, you, it's still about vine balance and every site um, is a little bit different. Mm -hmm. And that's part of what makes it so much fun. These are not widgets. Every vine is its own personality. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, a big garden. Are there anything, is, are there issues coming down the line that sort of resonate with you or that you're working on currently? Well, I think that um, on the West Coast, uh, water is obviously a big issue, less here in Oregon than it is in California. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that's misunderstood about Oregon is, although it rains eight or nine months out of the year, we do not have a lot of groundwater. Mm -hmm. Our aquifers are su such that we don't actually have a lot of groundwater. Mm -hmm. And many wineries, including ours, will run out of water in August and September, and you truck it in. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have a lot of surface water, and catching surface water is super important. Right. Um, so we work more and more on how to, um, how to use Mother Nature to help us with the water issue. Mm -hmm. um, that's big. Labor is becoming an issue for us. Um, and that will probably push more um, support on, more reliance on mechanical work in the vineyard, mm -hmm. and that doesn't necessarily feel right. Of course, that's because I'm an old timer. If you started in the business two years ago, it might seem perfectly normal. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, there's certainly, um, there's a lot of work to be done, but we're still an agricultural community and the process is still very the same, very much the same, mm -hmm. very much the same. And we've noticed that Grand Moraine is life certified. Could you yes. speak to that? Yes, so the Jackson family uh, policy for sustainability is huge. And in mm -hmm. fact, the head of the department is Katie Jackson, uh, Barbara and Jess's eldest daughter. 
Um, so super important part of the company and everywhere we work we're trying to tread more lightly. We have a big, a wa big water initiative, um, we've reduced water quite a bit but we have another 33% lessening in the next five years. Mm. Uh, so sustainability is a big deal. But these vineyards that were uh, managed by Ken Kupperman, our extraordinary vineyard manager, um, were live certified before they were purchased by Jackson Family. Mm -hmm. So any new holdings continue to be live certified. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we, we live certified this building. So that was the latest okay. thing that we did. So this is a live certified winery. And to give you the idea about how compatible this is with Oregon and uh, the philosophy, Penner Ash is all live certified. Mm -hmm. So there was nothing that we actually had to do there. They had the same attitude about sustainability going into it. So we have a lot of sustainability programs that we work on all the time. So okay. every facility has um, uh, solar panels and uh, the California commitment was just, I think, seven or eight million dollars worth of solar that is the equivalent of 1,400 houses, and I mean, it just goes on and on and on. So mm -hmm. it's a very robust program at Jackson Family. So we're just part of it. Good. You've definitely touched on this in a couple areas, but I want to call out um, a, a few people in the Oregon wine industry when the Jackson Family came in. Of course, there was nervousness. Yep. But it's been mentioned to us at least several times that they've really seemed to fit in and they really do care about a lot of things that the Oregon wine industry cares about. Yep. How have you seen their transition? Yeah, it's, it was interesting. There was a lot of nervousness. And I mm -hmm. think um, Oregon prides itself on making these incredibly um, high quality wines. You know, we're, we're on the global stage right now. It's a big deal. Mm -hmm. And I think people were concerned that they were going to come in and make um, a lesser expensive wine in very high volumes. Well, frankly, the paradigm of Oregon, it, you, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. We can't just double the crop or even add 10% to the crop. Mm -hmm. The crop is very fixed. We are farming on the northern edge of the ability to ripen Pinot Noir. Okay. So we don't have a lot of variability in the kinds of farming and things that we do. So it really wasn't a possibility for them to do it. And I think equally important, people only know Kendall Jackson and they don't know the other 39 wineries. Um, so they have small high-end wineries all over the world, not just mm -hmm. in California and now in Oregon. There are wineries in Italy and France and South Africa and Australia. And so they, they, they invest and mm -hmm. they only do one thing, wine. And everything starts from the vineyard up. So mm -hmm. it, there wasn't even the possibility of their doing one of those knockoff brands where you just buy a lot of bulk wine and blend it and sell it because you've got to grow the grapes in our company philosophy. You've got to be in control of your vineyards and then your production. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, and, and every brand has its own winemaker, so we don't cross over in winemaking. Right. Um, so it's, it's, and I just think it was, they were misunderstood. People just mm -hmm. didn't know all that information. All they thought of was one brand and one type of, of wine. And I might add that that wine is what finances and fuels everything that we do and that allows Grand Moraine to be Grand Moraine is because people are out there, millions of them, buying Kendall Jackson Vintner Reserve Chardonnay. Thank right. God, drink it up. But, um, but you know, that's what finances all of these smaller projects. Mm -hmm. um, I think that they realized that Jackson family not only was very serious about the wine business, their mm -hmm. only business, but very, very, very much a community player. Yes. And they came right in and demonstrated with their checkbook that they were a community player. Mm -hmm. And then beyond that, uh, over time, uh, the ability for all of the people that work here to be involved in the community in all of the, I mean, Salude. Um, mm -hmm. they, they made a big presence at Salude. Um, yes, the small Yamhill um, Enrichment yes. Society. Mm -hmm. um, so there are just you know, many, many small things uh, that they do all the time and allow their people to do it. Mm -hmm. One of the new programs that started last year, it's called Rooted for Good. And so it started with trying to do the whole winery, but when you get down to California, some of those are big. So every department, every winery, you have two days a year that your job is to go out into the community and have a volunteer day. Okay. And you're paid to do this. Mm -hmm. So it's food bank, it's planting trees, it's cleaning up the beach, whatever really works for the group that's going. Mm -hmm. And so we've closed down the winery for a day and off we go. And that's the kind of, th those things are encouraged. 
Yes. You're, you're supposed to be going out and doing that. Mm -hmm. And you know, that, that's just that kind of thing that happens at JFW that's pretty, pretty thoughtful. Yeah, it is pretty incredible. Yeah, it's pretty thoughtful. And I'm very glad to hear that, especially in detail. It sounds amazing. Yeah, we have a new program called JFW Cares, and it was the result of the uh, wildfires last year in California and the earthquake. Mm -hmm. And a number of JFW California employees were impacted. And they, some were more comfortable asking the company for help, others were not. So rather than set up that somewhat um, it, it may be intimidating environment, they have JFW Cares. So it started with a large endowment by the family. Mm -hmm. and we all participate in it. Mm -hmm. And 80% of it is there for disaster and emergency relief. So there's a formula for that. You don't have to be afraid of asking your supervisor. There is an absolute way that you request that. Mm -hmm. And then 20% of the money goes for scholarships. Um, for people's kids who really, or, or, or employees themselves or their kids mm -hmm. who really can't finance certain kinds of uh, higher education. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that started in the last couple of years. So, you know, just these small things that add up. Wonderful. Yeah. For Grand Moraine specifically, what would you say is the brand or, or what do you want it to be known for? Oh, for the quality of its wines, for the, for the elegance and the sophistication, but suppleness. Mm -hmm. um, and, and energy inside those wines. It's really, I mean, if I could leave, a, I'd like to leave a mark on the younger people that I work with. Um, I hope that I do a lot of informal mentoring mm -hmm. and um, help them understand how wonderful this industry is and how small it is, so be careful. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the next, the person you're talking to yesterday might be your boss tomorrow. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a very small and closely knit uh, community even beyond Oregon, I mean, even globally. Um, but I really would like the quality of the wines to be a real standout. Um, mm -hmm. And in Oregon, it's almost impossible to make a better Pinot Noir. There's so many great Pinot Noirs. If mm -hmm. I can make a really great, wonderful, fine Pinot, I'll be ecstatic. But there's a lot of room uh, in, in Chardonnay. Mm -hmm. And so I hope that Grand Marain will be a leader in the uh, renaissance and resurgence of uh, Chardonnay in Oregon. Mm -hmm. That'd be very happy. I bet would be very happy. Well, good luck. Yeah, thank you. Uh, do you have a winemaking philosophy? Uh, no, I think that if anything, I'm sort of a hands-off winemaker. I'm, 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 f I'm really a fanatic in the vineyard, and mm -hmm. I feel that in the vineyard, it's where you can put a lot of very, very fine detail and we have an unbelievable vineyard crew uh, headed by Ken um, and with Letty and Salvador, his right and left hand. Mm -hmm. um, but I think you can do a lot in the vineyard to create the best possible um, and most homogenous high quality piece of fruit, but then you get in the winery. But I think in the winery, it's a lot about letting the fruit and the site express itself. Mm -hmm. So if you're not working with the vineyard, that fits your philosophy, you're going to have a tug of war right from the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, and Grand Marine being a spectacular vineyard, and it's a large vineyard, it's almost 200 acres. There are a lot of sites and aspects and very variable clonal material, so there's a lot to work with just in that one vineyard. Mm -hmm. So, but, um, but really, great wine would be a wonderful legacy. Uh, you are very involved in the wine industry. Yeah. But even now with a full-time job yeah. and currently president of the Willamette Valley Wineries Association. Yeah. Uh, could you talk about what you are involved in and sort of the importance of it for you? Yeah. So um, I'll get back to that in a minute, but a couple sure. of other things. Live, I'm on the board of Live. Um, again, that uh, both the sustainability part of it and the agricultural part of it are hugely mm -hmm. important to me. Mm -hmm. um, we live and breathe the air and Everything we do in the vineyard is um, and it affects everything around it, um, so it's a whole environmental kind mm. of way of thinking. Mm -hmm. And and live um, along with one of the things that it, it does similarly to uh, biodynamics is it's a whole farm concept, mm -hmm. and so you're looking at every part of what you do. And I I really like that about live. Um, I'm on the Wine Advisory Board for Chemeketa, mm -hmm. which is wonderful because that's where we're grooming so many young people uh, to come into this industry. Mm -hmm. It's become a great resource. 
um, not just for vineyard and winery, but uh, they're, they're working more on business and sales and marketing and uh, general management and all the things that are required to run a winery, a small winery. You've got to wear a lot of hats. Yes. Uh, so Chemeketa, and that's been very important. Um, and then I was very involved in the new auction, in the barrel auction on that steering committee, and that was a, a just a raging success. Mm -hmm. So that was really exciting. Um, and then the Willamette Valley Wineries Association. And mm -hmm. because of that barrel auction, we're in a new paradigm. We used to come up with ideas and decide we loved them and then looked around the room to figure out, okay, how are we going to finance this? Right. And now we have a small amount of money, which we hope will grow as mm -hmm. the barrel auction grows. Mm -hmm. And it shifts the paradigm. Now we have to do budgets and we have to, um, and we're essentially a marketing organization, marketing the Willamette Valley as a region and our wines uh, and what they mean to the community and how they're an expression of who we are and what we're doing. Right. And, um, but we're in, a, we're in a, a wonderful opportunity to grow up. You know, we've hit the world stage and it's time for the organization to, to step up. We know we need additional uh, staffing and so mm -hmm. there's a real conversation going on w uh, uh, on the board and, and the extended board. A lot of um, past presidents and old board members, we have a new strategic planning committee and so there's a lot of work going on right now. It's very dynamic um, and it's very uh, consolidating. It's about really bringing everything in together so we can work as a team and mm -hmm. and use our resources more wisely and more efficiently. So that's really pretty exciting right now. Excellent. Yeah. One thing that we definitely notice, especially with the Oregon wine industry, is that everybody has their full-time job, their own yeah. business, etc. <laughs> right. And then it seems like they're involved in at least three other really important organizations yeah. that also sound like full-time jobs. Yeah. What do you think it is about the Oregon wine industry and about a lot of the people in it where that even exists? Yeah, it's it's funny. I did an email just this morning and it was, thank you so much for jumping in and taking on this project in our volunteer environment because it really is. And, right. you know, there's, there's always that... Uh, 10, 15, 20 people that stay very active. Mm -hmm. And we notice that we're all on the same boards and you know, moving around boards and things like that. Mm -hmm. I think it's a sense of community. I think that we get a lot of personal pleasure and satisfaction about the community being viewed as, um, as what it is, not just mm -hmm. individually or individual brands or winery projects. And I think these people all know that one plus one is eight or 10 or 50. It's not two when you get a big group together like that. I mean, we can really make important things happen collectively that we can't make happen individually. And we get it. You know, the all boats rise, whatever that saying is that I never can get right. We all get that. And I think that's been clear from day one in Oregon. When you talk about the first five families and sitting around the dining room table, um, and David Adelsheim was one of those. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it's, a, it's been a remarkable um, collective project from the day this industry started. And uh, you get into IPNC, and then you have OPC, and you have all these, and now the barrel auction, and you have all these projects that bring the community together. And mm -hmm. they get it, they know that, you know, that, that in this case, more is more. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, in your experiences for Oregon, what are some of the differences and similarities it has with California, for example? Well, I, I think being um, agrarian-based, it is a little more challenging to farm here, but uh, even my growing up in Napa and Sonoma in the industry, if you needed something, if you had a problem, you had a neighbor. Mm -hmm. And um, the people that are doing the work are still the, the viticulturalists, the farmers, the winemakers, and still come with a very similar attitude. Um, as things get larger, that becomes more difficult. I think what is advantageous for Napa Valley is it is, a, is, is physically a small area, mm -hmm. and that helps. Mm -hmm. Sonoma County is very broad. That makes it a little bit more challenging. Um, and we're, well, Napa Valley is pretty big too. And so it's, um, uh, but I think these, these AVAs are AVA uh, organizations, mm -hmm. keep the AVAs very well 
um, collectively organized and in communication and conversation. Mm -hmm. um, I think there are a lot of similarities because we're in the same business doing the same thing. Um, I think all Pinot Noir producers consider themselves traditionally the underdog. There was, the world was all Cabernet and we've had to sort of fight and scratch for, um, for, for the kind of accolades um, that we're getting, mm -hmm. but it's always been, we've always been the little sister to the big Cabernet. So I think Pinot Noir production brings all those people together. Mm -hmm. uh, Steamboat, which is one of the great organizations that was founded between the Oregon and the California industry. Mm -hmm. And the first couple, um, it swapped between Oregon and California. Mm -hmm. And then soon it became clear that Steamboat was the most wonderful place to have it in the world. And so it's been at Steamboat now for what, 30 years, 35 yeah. years. Mm -hmm. I think my first one was 1982 or something like that. So um, I think that there's a lot of similarity in the people and their approach to, to their work and, and what mm -hmm. they do. Mm -hmm. in the end. And so same question, but for internationally, in your experiences abroad, how have some of those growing regions differed from Oregon, or how are they similar? I, I, I think they're very similar in that it's the same kind of person that is involved in agriculture mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and involved in wine. When you get into our business, it's everything. It's not just growing grapes and making wine. So it's not just um, agriculture and the art craft science of winemaking. It's business, it's social, it's family, it's community. Mm -hmm. So I think that the, it, the same, it draws the same type of people no matter where you are. I do a lot of work in France now and my families in France are the, just very much the same kind of down to earth, um, very warm, very lovely people. Mm -hmm. Our regions and the challenges and opportunities that every different region brings makes that, that nuance that's different. Is it mm -hmm. a hot climate? Is it a cool climate? Does, do you, what are you worried about at harvest? Getting too hot, you've got to get the grapes off the vine, or you've got the rains you know, <laughs> sneaking up behind you. So right. I think every environment creates its own set of hurdles and challenges and opportunities, but mm -hmm. I think the basic individuals that are in this industry worldwide are very, very similar. Mm -hmm. and, and where else can you travel anywhere in the world in a grape-growing region and be welcomed as if it were your neighbor next door. It's right. an amazing thing. You can call anybody anywhere in the world and say, I'll be there next week, can I see your, in, your place? And they're like, yeah, come mm -hmm. on over. Mm -hmm. yeah. They don't say don't forget to bring a bottle of wine, but they mean that. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Uh, what is it like being a woman in the wine industry? <laughs> um, you know, it's, it, I was, I've been asked that question a lot, particularly when I was younger. And mm. I think I was the first female president, uh, non-family female president of any, any winery in California, which would probably be Oregon too. Um, but mostly I had men that were very supportive and when they discovered, uh, I'm not very um, sensitive to um, sort of the, the, the humor that comes with, with life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just sort of roll off that, that stuff sort of rolls off me. So mm -hmm. um, I, I had a lot of mentors, all of whom were men, and that saw somebody that was totally passionate about what they were doing, very committed, mm -hmm. and did whatever they could to help. And so every time I've been moved along in a career path, mm -hmm. um, I've been supported by men. So um, I, I can't be, I can't bash them up too badly. So they've been good to me. Good. So. Uh, where do you see the Oregon wine industry going? Well, nothing more but up, 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 I, or, or out, 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 or whatever, whatever w would be the expression for, um, um, I'm going to say better, mostly better through, um, through resources. Mm -hmm. There was a time when if Oregon was behind California, it was not about the area itself by the intrinsic organic sense of the area. It's about the lack of resources, primarily the lack of capital. Mm -hmm. So again, we talked about vineyards, wineries, and, and winemakers making this three-legged stool. Mm -hmm. Well, they weren't here originally. They were homegrown. They were underfinanced. Um, so with time, money has come in to build wineries that can create world-class wines, um, develop vineyards, uh, and bring the personnel that can do that. So it just keeps attracting uh, more and more people that can contribute more and more to the community. 
I think the challenge for us, and we talk about this a lot, which is good, mm -hmm. is how to make or, uh, keep Oregon, Oregon, and how to c maintain our personality and right. our close-knit community, our relationship to the community and to each other, and to not lose the values that got us here in the first place. And mm -hmm. that's a big part of the conversation. Right. And so far it's been successful, but it takes a lot of stewards to, mm -hmm. to maintain that. Right, actual yeah. purposeful. Purposeful, yeah. thoughtful, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so that's, that's where we're going. Good. Yeah. Uh, is there a saturation point or a cap that you think might be coming up? That question was asked in one of our seminars the other day, and Ken Wright answered it. Ken was one of our uh, participants, and his answer was no. There's lots of farmland left to be planted. There's lots of work left to be done. Um, we are on the world stage now, but we need to, we need to own that stage. Mm -hmm. um, we need to have everybody around the world, when somebody says Pinot Noir, they say, well, I'm at Valley. I mean, you know, it just has to be an, an absolute. Right. I mean, it's clear that Cabernet and Napa Valley are synonymous, and Cabernet and Bordeaux are synonymous, mm -hmm. and Pinot Noir and Burgundy are synonymous. Now it's got to be Pinot Noir and, and, and Willamette Valley. Mm -hmm. So, no, I don't think we're anywhere near done. Uh, David often asks the question, what's this going to look like in 100 years, and 500 years? And, you know, we can look back on Europe to get some reference point, but mm -hmm. who knows? Um, and we have challenges, you know, we have to look at climate change. Mm -hmm. Is this a um, temporary environment? Is this a long-term environment? What do we do differently? How do we maintain our style and the integrity of our wines if we're, you know, shifting to a warmer climate? Right. So there's, there's still a lot of those kinds of challenges going on. And we'll meet them. Good. Uh, what advice would you give someone looking to enter the wine industry? Well, the first thing you should be is very passionate about it because mm -hmm. this is life. This is not mm -hmm. Monday through Friday, nine to five. So if, if the wine industry is not your life, part of it because so much is entertaining and sharing what you're doing. I mean, what is better than wine at the dinner table? I mean, that's its whole point after all. So that is a big part of what we do, mm -hmm. whether you're at home and you're doing it in, uh, or you're out in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of weekend work, there's a lot of evening work, um, it helps to have it be a family affair, uh, but y if you can't bring that attitude, um, you probably will not be ultimately successful, and you won't be as rewarded by it. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of opportunity. When I got started, there was nothing called winejobs.com. As a matter of fact, there weren't even computers, and there weren't <laughs> fax machines, and there certainly weren't cell phones. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you knocked on a door. I got my first job by, I was moved back to Sonoma County and started knocking on people's doors and said, I'm here, can I do something? Can I wash the floors, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, it worked. Um, and you can still do that. But we have so many ways that you can get involved in the industry now and just winejobs.com, um, no, no ad there, no payoff. Right. Um, but you can go there and you can find job opportunities in any part of the business, whether you want to be in distribution, winemaking, hospitality, it's all there. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of opportunity. Um, so I think it's nice to know what you're doing, but if you get into a small company, you can try a little of everything. Uh, it's the other thing that somebody like Jackson Family can offer. If you would like to do uh, an internship in Australia, then you can't go next week, but if you give everybody notice, you can probably go next harvest. Mm -hmm. And so you can move around in different departments at the mm -hmm. same time. It's a lot of mentoring. There's a full-on mentoring program, uh, but you can cross cross department. You don't have to just train in your own department. So if you've kind of mm -hmm. had this fantasy that maybe I'd like to work there, mm -hmm. uh, you can try that inside this, this particular company. Mm -hmm. But you can do that in the community quite well. And again, small wineries, you get to wear all the hats. So right. get to do a little of everything. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of opportunity right now. But um, you need to want to do it. You really have to want to be in this industry. Mm -hmm. It's a full-time industry. Full-time times three, yeah, really. It's, it's, your, it's your life. It really yeah. is. It's got to be your life. Wonderful. Well, those were all of my planned questions. Did anything come up that you guys want me to ask? Okay. Was there anything I should have asked or any last notes that you'd like to leave with us? It's a good question. Is there anything I want to say on the, on the record? Exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah for, for posterity. Now? 
I don't think so. It's, right. the best, it's, I don't, it's the best industry in the world, so unless you're famously rich. And then you can just own a winery, I guess. Yes. Yeah, so. Wonderful. I, I highly recommend it. Good. That's it. All right. Well, thank you so much, thank Eugenia. You. Thank you.